I've always been fascinated by nomads. Constantly on the move. That's the most beautiful journey. Surviving in the world's most remote wildernesses. Where's the removal van when you need it? <laughs> and living cheek by jowl with nature, it's always seemed a wildly romantic existence. It's the most magical place. But it's no easy life. It's the sort of cold that makes you feel physically sick. And in today's modern world, <laughs> they're under increasing pressure. I'm going to live with three groups of nomads. In Nepal, Namaste. Mongolia, and now with the Nanets in Siberia. These reindeer herders have always lived life on the margins. But today, giant global threats are encroaching on their traditional migrations. Can they hold on to their ancient way of life? The Yamal Peninsula in northern Russia a vast and frozen wasteland jutting deep into the Arctic Circle. Home to the nomadic reindeer people, the Nanets. In their language, Yamal means end of the world, and if anywhere feels like that, it's this place. Minus 26 is the air temperature, but with the wind chill, it's minus 35.3. I have never been in the Arctic wilderness in the teeth of the winter. I feel inadequately prepared for life in a landscape like this, and in temperatures like these. It's truly impossible to imagine how any human being could or would choose to live in a region like this. The Nanettes have survived in these extremes for generations. But now they're facing serious threats that could undermine their traditional way of life. Like so many places in the world, this is an environment that's changing rapidly. Particularly with regards to climate. In 2013, a dramatic temperature rise in midwinter led to the death of thousands of reindeer. But it isn't the only threat to these people. The discovery of huge reserves of gas in the northern peninsula have brought in machinery, have brought in roads, have brought in railways. This massive infrastructure supporting the gas industry is squeezing and blocking the Nanette's migratory routes. I'm hoping to find out how they're coping as these pressures stack up against them. It's early December, and our journey begins at the edge of the Arctic Circle in the town of Salakart. From here, six-wheel drive trucks called Trekkles are taking us 200 kilometers further north. We've arranged a rendezvous with the Nanette's family who are migrating south across the tundra, the barren permafrost of the Yamal Peninsula. We've been making our way painfully slowly along this very difficult road and suddenly uh, the truck in front of us, which is carrying all the fuel and a lot of our equipment, lost an entire tyre. This is the size of the thing that we're dealing with. 
So poor Sergei and Igor are now having to try and work out um, how they can get this back on the trailer. As night falls, the temperature drops to minus 40. Attempting a repair in these conditions is perilously difficult. The trailer didn't get fixed last night, and uh, we ended up here, which is one of these strange um, trading posts next to the railway. It was midnight and everybody decided that if there was anywhere to stay, we would give up for the night. We did actually find a part, which is miraculous, and Sergei and Igor are welding it onto the trailer. But we spent the night here in a shipping container. Um, everybody crowded in together. Frankly, if we manage to get to the Nanette's camp today, I think it'll be a miracle. This remote trading post serves as a depot for Gazprom, the Russian energy giant exploiting the gas fields here. And as one of the many reindeer slaughterhouses that are dotted across the peninsula. In recent years, many Nanettes have been forced to leave their nomadic lives. Some of them have ended up working here. I heard there was um, very bad weather for reindeer last year and that a lot of herders like yourself lost a lot of animals. It's a truly heartbreaking story, one that's been repeated across the tundra. In 2013, over 15,000 reindeer died and over 60 families were ruined. Is there something, one thing, that you would hold responsible for that, that you would blame for that? With the trailer repaired, there's over 100 kilometers to go and the temperature is a staggeringly low, minus 54. Basically, um, we tried to leave the trading post and almost instantly the truck all got a puncture. And as they were fixing that, the diesel started to freeze in both vehicles. So nothing is working. 
I think the real concern is that if we try and head off even further into the wilderness, we might be stranded in the middle of nowhere. To make matters worse, the delays mean we've missed our rendezvous with the Nanette's family we had planned to stay with. We've no choice but to head back to our starting point, the town of Salakart. Being up there at that trading post gave me a real sense of, you know, of another way of life. I just felt deeply saddened by the way that those people's lives had turned out. Those men were killing reindeer. Day in, day out, that was their job. And those were people whose whole lives had been about living with, living alongside, and looking after reindeer. That would destroy the most robust of human souls. Having missed the meeting with our original family, we need to find another group who will take us in. Our quest for a new reindeer herding family has begun in a different truckle, this one running on petrol, so hopefully it won't freeze up, despite the fact that it is absolutely bitter again outside, minus 35. We head for another slaughterhouse where we've been told Nanette's families are delivering their reindeer. Slaughterhouses over there. At this time of year, the Nanettes come in from their camps in the surrounding tundra to sell some of their animals. The cash they earn will buy what they need to survive the year ahead. Maybe we'll go up. Let's, let's go up and see. It's an extraordinary but sad sight as the reindeer are rounded up into pens ready for slaughter. Every part of the animal is used. The meat is sold into a profitable global market while the fur is made into clothing. It's indescribably cold. It's the sort of cold that makes you feel physically sick if you exert yourself in any way. And it feels like I'm sort of, I've jumped into this otherworldly scene of kind of life and death, it, it's hard to describe when your brain is frozen. Oh, oh. It's so cold. I can feel my eyelashes freezing to my cheeks. The Yamal Peninsula is home to the world's largest reindeer population, with 600,000 animals looked after by 15,000 nomads. It's rather sad that my first view of the reindeer here is the ones that are about to be slaughtered. But I suppose what they also represent is the survival for another year of the people who own them. <laughs> With the reindeer rounded up, their owners take a break inside a communal building. Good. Should we do that one as well? Ready? Oh, it's got a 
<laughs> there are several families here, but one seems particularly friendly. So Natasha, who who lives with your family? And um, will you be uh, migrating uh, again when you're finished here, <coughs> Natasha? Mm -hmm. Would you allow me to come and learn from you about uh, the Nanette's way of life? Women are in charge, always. <laughs> we set off for the family's camp, Natasha and her daughter guiding the way while Kostya travels back on his sledge. It's an hour's drive through the snow and across a frozen river. Sorry. That's okay. okay. No, you're doing good driving, Daniel, don't worry. There's a man up a tree here. I see, what on earth is he doing? Apparently he's trying to get mobile phone signal. This is modern nomadism for you. Oh, it's beautiful, look. <laughs> Natasha and Kostya are nearing the end of their 500 kilometer seasonal migration. Uh, At the moment, they're moving every few days. They're traveling with two other families. Next door is Yegor, Kostya's brother. And in the third tent, or chum, is their friend Vitali. Okay, okay. <laughs> these traditional chums are all that protect these families from the harsh Siberian winter. A simple wooden frame is covered with reindeer skins, and that's it. Without a fire, it's as cold inside as out, and right now, that's minus 38. But what a place to be. Something so harsh and bleak about this landscape. And it seems amazing that these little pyramids of snow are enough to keep whole families alive in conditions as harsh as this. I think the thing that always strikes me is just how, how pared down their lives are. You know, this is it. Kostya has to move the herd to new pasture. So while his neighbors round up the reindeer to pull the sleds, he prepares the harnesses. So is it the same rule for children? In Nanette's culture, once a female reaches puberty, it's considered bad luck if she steps over ropes, poles, and even men's boots. 
It's believed to bring misfortune to the family and their herd. So Kostya, when I see this, should I lift it up and put it over like this? No, no, just walk around. So I have to walk around it. And that's just for women. For men, it's OK, you can step. Okay. These ancient beliefs are part of the Nanette's animist faith. They believe everything in nature possesses a spiritual force. When women start to menstruate, they become directly connected to this force, known by the Nanette's as Saya May. <laughs> Kostya and his neighbors share over 300 reindeer, and like their ancestors, they rely on them for food, warmth, and transport. The three families own individual animals, but they all share the workload. Amazingly, Kostya, Yegor, and Vitali can tell each animal apart, even at several hundred meters. Oh, you got it. Good shot. The Nanette's animals are semi domesticated cousins of wild reindeer. The bulk of the herd is for trading, while some are used to pull sleds. A few are believed to be sacred and will not be killed until they're too old to walk. Can you all explain to me how important reindeer are to your life? So this is my uh, my first great neck ride on a reindeer sledge. It's an incredibly exhilarating feeling. We're taking the herd out to new pasture for the night. It's a four-kilometer ride. looks incredibly rough but it's actually quite a smooth ride and they move a lot faster than you think. The men's days are ruled by caring for their reindeer, making sure they get enough food and protecting the herd from predators like foxes, eagles, wolverines and wolves. Actually, it's quite heavy. I don't quite know how we're going to get through here. We're going just splashing through some trees. After half an hour, we arrive at a clearing. The reindeer scrape through the snow to reach the lichen below. Remarkably, it's all that sustains them through the long winter months. <laughs> the 
the Nanets need to be constantly on the move, migrating up and down the peninsula to ensure that their herds have enough to eat. Just to be out here with these people, having had all the trials and tribulations we've had. And what was really, really lovely was just seeing how Costio completely understood his reindeer, his dogs, the landscape. You know, I've only just met him. I think I've lost my heart. And this little puppy, you did well, didn't you, little tail? You can see he's clearly learning from the other dogs. And when the other dogs are all going, hur, hur, this one's going, hur, hur. see? Go on, do it again. Hur, hur. Go on, little tail. Let them go, head away, my boy. This one's not going to go. Hur, sure. Go on, you go. We all bed down in the chum together, the family on one side, the crew and I on the other. in the morning. They've been amazingly hospitable, these two. Um, they absolutely refused to uh, let me and the crew sleep in a tent. They thought we'd die. So um, we spent the night here in the chum and um, I think this is where we're going to be for the next week. I'm quite tired. <laughs> Most days, the men tend to the reindeer, whilst the women look after the home. And these strict gender roles also extend to the dress code. So Natasha and her neighbour, which is also her sister-in-law, have um, told me that basically wearing a pair of salopettes is completely unacceptable. So I need to wear a skirt. So do you both make all your clothes? So, Natasha, how did you meet Kostya? <laughs> what, what happens? Can you tell me about an Annette's wedding? So when your sons are older, will you do the same for them? Okay, so I put it in like that. Yeah? What do you think? What? Come here. <laughs> <laughs> Look at us. We are the best looking girls on the tundra. <laughs> what do you think? Pretty? 
Yeah. <laughs> Natasha and Kostya's camp is next to the Gazprom railway. This afternoon, the director of the 350-mile train track is coming to visit. The railway has blocked some of the Nanette's migration routes as the reindeer and sleds struggle to cross the track. The gas industry has also been accused of damaging feeding grounds. Alexandra Melanchuk and his family are here on a PR exercise to find out how this heavy industry is affecting the Nanette's lives. Yeah. So Galina and Galina, is this your first time up to this area? Yeah, your first time. First time. Uh -huh. And Alexander, you you work up here? You're based up here, your work? Да, я здесь живу. И здесь работаю, uh -huh. здесь uh -huh. Обеспечиваем доставку грузов на Бованенковское месторождение. Uh -huh. Да, перевозками занимаемся. When the Soviet state collapsed in the 1990s, multinational corporations flooded in to explore the tundra for its huge gas reserves. In 2011, Gazprom, the Russian energy giant, began to exploit them. At $41 billion, it's the fourth most expensive energy project in the world and a vital and strategic part of the Russian economy. How did you meet Kostya and Natasha? В прошлом году Константин как раз весной был рядышком здесь. Мне интересно их быт, как они живут, соответственно, да. Ну и интересно, значит, насколько они привязаны к дороге. To compensate the Nanettes for blocking some of their migration routes, the railway has made concessions. И соответственно, мы должны строить специальные переходы плавные, чтобы могли на олени упряжка спокойно переезжать. Ну, я вам скажу, что насколько полезно. Was any um, compensation given to uh, to the nomadic people in this area? Ну, в любом случае, любая индустриализация, любая индустриализация, она приносит какой-то определенный урон наносит. Соответственно, конечно, оплачивают их за вот эти земли, за которые мы. The gas industry pays each Nanette's adult 20 pounds a month and funds development across the tundra. Арендуем, да, за счет этого, за счет этого развивается их социалька, значит, строятся поселки, обустраиваются. Do you think that this is good progress for the people of the tundra? Всегда придет то время, когда они сами решат, когда им где где жить. Почему бы не цивилизацию найдет? It was a very interesting little visit. I thought the most telling thing about him was uh, how extraordinarily well media trained he was. There was a man who was never, ever, ever going to answer a question straight. There are, no doubt, some benefits for the Nanettes. The tax revenues raised by the local government from the gas industry are helping to finance schools and medical facilities in the Yamal district. What scares me is that these are big, powerful industries and I suspect pretty unstoppable. Is this a way of them seemingly to be doing the local people here a favor when actually what they're doing is gently eradicating their culture. With gas production planned to treble over the next 15 years, the impact on the Nanettes is only just beginning. It's very early in the morning, and the family are on the move. It's migration day, the absolute essence of nomadism. For me, it's incredibly romantic. It's sort of thing that as a child, you know, I wanted to be a nomad or a gypsy or in the circus, you know, somebody who was constantly on the move. Kostya, Natasha, their neighbours and their reindeer are heading for new pastures, and I'm going with them. 
Everything has to be packed up and put on a specific sled. <laughs> Literally five minutes ago, everyone was sitting around, very relaxed, having tea. And then suddenly, the whole thing is dismantled in what seems like moments. It's like trying to manoeuvre giant chopsticks. It's taken three hours to pack three families and their entire lives onto 33 sleds. The migration is a colourful affair. The sleds are decorated with bells and red leather tassels and the reindeer wear special harnesses. It's a very beautiful thing. What's it made out of? This is mama? Mama, really? Mama. Do you still find mammoth sometimes out in the tunnel? <laughs> With everything finally packed, we're off. We head down the ice road alongside the railway with the herd following behind. Kostya and Natasha have traveled nearly 500 kilometers south since September, and now are only a few weeks away from their winter grazing grounds. Dusk's falling as we head off the road and onto the wide open tundra. <laughs> After six kilometers, we arrive at the new camp, just as the wind picks up. This is our new home. What I'm really getting the sense of is, is this relationship between them and their reindeer. Is it's a symbiotic relationship which allows people and animal to, to be up in this really wild place and to not just to scratch a survival, but live a kind of enviably successful way of life here.
It's quite funny, I just caught Natasha having a little moment with some of her reindeer. She's a complete softie and she comes out here with bits of bread and feeds some of her favourites. Including you, doesn't she? Hmm? I haven't got any bread. You're a reindeer, you're supposed to eat lichen. The reindeer are meticulously cared for because the Nanettes simply can't live without them. <coughs> Reindeer meat is the staple food, and one animal can last a family up to a month. So, posture is uh, killing a reindeer um, now. and he stuns the animal first with the axe on the top of the head. Um, and then he stabs it in the back of the head and then straight into the heart. And the animal's dead already. This is a non-breeding male that's been kept specifically for meat. Nothing will be wasted. The Nanettes eat some of the reindeer meat raw Scherze. and the fat and offal while it's still warm. It's a delicacy to drink the blood, which is salted to stop it congealing. Very small posture. <laughs> but the biggest treat is the warm, raw <laughs> liver. So I take all of it, like this, and can I have well, half of it? <laughs> it's quite a mental process hmm? to uh, to eat this. I can't say I'm enjoying it terribly much, but. Mm -hmm. It's actually a very mild taste and an oddly kind of quite a crisp texture. You sort of um, expect liver to be soft because I've only ever had it cooked before. The families gather round the reindeer carcass to eat their fill, but they've asked us not to film any close-ups. In the past, the Nanettes have been portrayed badly in Russian and foreign media, sometimes being called savages and even vampires for eating raw meat. But why wouldn't you eat the meat while it's fresh and warm? In this cold, it'll be frozen solid in minutes. The Nanettes make almost everything they need, their sleds, harnesses, chums, and all their clothing. Whilst Kostya works on some antlers that he can sell, Natasha's making sewing thread from dried reindeer sinew. Mm-hmm. Okay. Oh, I got my own hair stick. <laughs> 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 
<laughs> Don't tempt me. Hello. <laughs> it's one of Natasha and Kostya's sons. Their three sons are away at school. It's the legacy of the old Soviet system which provided education for all Nanets. Most children have to board as their parents are constantly on the move. Is it hard to send your children away to school? And do they then come back and and spend the holidays here with you? And Papanea, how old will she be when she goes to school? Natasha, get her on the subject of education and you can see there's a slight a slight sort of mistiness comes over her. She would love, I think, to have gone to university. And although Kostya and Natasha feel very rooted here to the tundra, it would be interesting to see what choices their children make. And I suppose the reality is, will they be actually be able to make that choice or will gas extraction and climate actually take that choice away from them? I don't know. It's my last morning living alongside Natasha, Kostya and their family. Thank you so much for all your help. Thank you for lending me your beautiful coat. I've become genuinely fond of the whole family. So leaving them is going to be hard. Okay, Papa Ney. <laughs> Gotcha! Gotcha! <laughs> this is a life that is incredibly difficult, not just because it's so cold, you know, we're north of the Arctic Circle. This is a life on the edge. Natasha! <laughs> Thank you! <laughs> Nomadic families all over the world are, are adapting, evolving, if you like, to include parts of the modern world that suit them. But I get the feeling here that they've done all those things, but there is such a big outside influence that is also chipping, chipping, chipping insidiously away at their lives. And that is the fact that the Yamal Peninsula is one big gas reserve. Thank you. Thanks, Kostya. Frankly, a few nomadic people 
are not going to be able to stop that level of development. And I really hope I'm wrong, but I'm just not sure. And that makes me feel genuinely sad. Next time, I journey to Mongolia. It's the most magical place. To live with a family of nomads who are adapting to the modern world, deep in the Gobi Desert. But life in this wilderness is still dominated by the power of nature. Like any good Mongolian spring day, it's starting to snow. As storms and predators constantly threaten their nomadic way of life. I can't stand here and say, don't kill that wolf. It's not my place to.